What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 238. Today, we are going to be covering a case out of Canada, actually, that was highly requested in our little request form. Was. This is a really interesting one because there's a very strong possibility that Emma Philippoff is still out there. Mm -hmm. And her mother's been looking for her quite extensively over the years. And there's been a number of sightings and different pieces of evidence, really, that would suggest that she's still out there. Obviously, there's some other theories and possibilities out there mm -hmm. as well. But I think one of the reasons why we cover so many disappearances is because by covering it, we're obviously creating some awareness around the case. Mm -hmm. And there's the always, goal. you know, there's always that, you know, sometimes far off chance that maybe that person will be found or a tidbit of information or mm -hmm. just get to the right ears and you know that person may have seen her or known something um, that they can report to the authorities and hopefully we'll be able to locate her at least i think at this point we're really just trying to figure out if she's okay and if she's still alive out there mm -hmm. um so. it's just so unsettling to cover disappearances i mean it just drives you nuts thinking about all the possibilities the idea that someone could be out there after all this time and just has yet to be found or maybe they don't want to be found, just very eerie. And I know many of you can understand that feeling of just wondering what happens to these people. And I really can't imagine what it's like as a family member to not have those answers. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, especially now that we're parents, it's mm -hmm. our perspective with these cases especially has, has changed. And I just can understand the daily anguish parents must go yeah. through when they're you know, sons or daughters are missing and mm -hmm. they have no idea where they are or, or what happened to them. And just, I think that's why these are so important to talk about and why, you know, we, we definitely put a focus on it. Yeah. Just seeing interviews of Emma's mom speaking about her and the anguish that their family has dealt with since she's been gone is absolutely heartbreaking. And seeing her, you know, on foot going around, trying to spread the word about her daughter, um, yeah, it's just, you know, now that we have this platform, we just want to be able to help in some of these cases. And maybe, you know, you never know. Maybe there's someone out there who has seen Emma, knows something. And yeah, we just want to get this information out to you guys. So, but with that being said, let's just go ahead and start by giving you a little background on Emma. So, Emma Philipoff was born January 6th, 1986 in Perth, Canada to her parents, Shelley and James Philipoff. She has an older brother named Matthew, an older sister named Erica, and a younger brother named Alexander. So Perth is a small, quiet town in rural Ontario, and it's a very tight-knit community. In 2021, Perth had a population of 6,469. Shelley worked as a French teacher, and she loved being a mother. All of the Philipoff siblings were very close growing up. But Emma was especially close with Alexander, who was eight years younger than her. Emma had always been a quiet girl, but she was content being quiet and really taking the world in. You could tell she had a lot going on in her mind. She was very private, and she also kept her feelings to herself. This would be kind of a theme throughout her entire life. Emma had a lot of friends growing up, and she'd always been a very naturally creative person as well, like her dad. But just like him, she was very secretive and non-confrontational. Her mother was more strict than her father, so Emma's siblings would try and stand up to their mother's rules, but Emma would close up and withdraw instead of fighting. Her mother says that mental illness does run in their family. Emma kept journals, and from those, it looked like she had been struggling with her mental health since she was 11 years old. When Emma was 16, she decided that she didn't like having a curfew, so she decided to move out of the house and moved in with her friend, Ellen. But when she realized that Ellen's parents also had a curfew for their kids, Emma moved out again. This time, she moved into an apartment with an older guy. But this roommate actually wasn't her boyfriend. At 16 years old, Emma was dating a 26-year-old. Emma was very beautiful and quiet, and she seemed to attract attention from a lot of older guys. Around the same time, Emma quit school and started working at a video store in Perth. Her mom realized that she couldn't enforce the rules with Emma the same way that she could with her other kids. But when Emma asked to see her younger brother, who really missed her, Shelly caved in and said yes. So Shelly would drop Alexander off at the video store on Sundays so that they could watch movies together. 
She also brought Emma toiletries, which she figured she was struggling to afford. After eight months, Emma decided to come back home, but she didn't want to go to her usual high school. So instead, she enrolled in an alternative high school where she earned good grades. Those grades earned her a scholarship to the Loyalist College in Belleville, where she studied photojournalism. Emma was very good-natured and whimsical, as her family describes her. So she did attract a lot of different people to her. But her father worried that she was too giving and that people would take advantage of her. And things started to get rough for her in her 20s. Her father, James, left her mother, Shelley, for a younger woman. And the two had a bitter divorce. And this was really hard on their whole family. And Emma was very upset by all of this. Their separation was very hard for them. And of course, since she loved to write, she wrote multiple poems about the situation. In one, she writes, My parents' marriage is in shambles. My father turning to me. My mother hating us both. And me. Always the good listener. Too nice to say that it hurt me too. In another, she wrote, I chased death all my life. Because I was dead. Sleeping was an escape from all the pain. And stories were the sweet music rain. I love my mom, but I could not cause her pain. Her poetry is honestly just beautiful. Yeah, it's very deep. And yeah, you can just tell she's a deep soul and a, a big thinker too. Mm -hmm, definitely. So Emma decided to move back to Perth a year before she went missing. She had suffered a knee problem and was looking to get some treatment. During this time, she became very thin. Her father noticed Emma wasn't eating a lot and he was concerned. But he didn't say anything. Just like Emma, he was very secretive and non-confrontational. So he decided to respect her privacy. Emma would cook for him all the time, but she didn't eat much herself. She also walked around barefoot a lot. And she would do this so much that her feet would get bloody. During this time, Emma was living with her father and with friends. But she didn't live with Shelly. When she would run into her, she always had some excuse as to why she couldn't stay. Shelly thought that during this time, Emma was abnormally happy and it didn't seem drug-induced. She would wander around Perth all day and night as if she were avoiding life. Looking back, something seemed off. Her mother, Shelley, has admitted that she had a mental health crisis after her husband left her, and unfortunately, Emma witnessed some of those incidents. Emma actually had to call the police when her mother threatened her father with a knife. Shelley said that she'd gone berserk, but she wasn't going to hurt James. But she was sick, and Emma didn't know that. Shelly says she couldn't give Emma her side of the story, so they never talked about the incident. Soon after that, Emma decided to move. She and her mother only spoke when Emma would send cryptic emails and very occasionally call. Emma had always dreamed of moving out west. She wanted to be close to the water, so Victoria, British Columbia would be the perfect spot. And at 25 years old, she was really trying to find herself. Emma told one of her friends that she thought something amazing would happen in Victoria. So in the fall of 2011, Emma packed her things and moved. Before she left, she sold, gave away, and threw out a decent amount of her personal belongings. She had no job lined up and no place to live, but she, you know, she figured she was going to figure it out once she got there. So when she finally arrived, she was able to live with a childhood friend and their partner. And after a few months of that, she moved into an apartment in that same building. Emma got a job working as a barista in the winter of 2011, but that job didn't last very long. She sort of started living a more transient lifestyle after that and she moved out of the apartment. Emma ended up moving in with another friend for a while and then she got a housekeeping job at Hotel 760 where she also lived for a little bit. She also lived on two to three boats for some time and Emma would even sleep in the woods alone and she'd even sometimes sleep in a tree. But in between those different housing situations, Emma had actually been staying on and off at the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter since the winter of 2011. She'd usually stay in the shelter's attic for a month at a time. Emma's family had no idea that she'd been staying at the shelter. In fact, Emma didn't keep in touch with family at all that much. She sometimes sent emails to friends and family back home, and these emails were described as being cryptic, poetic, and upbeat. And occasionally on holidays, she would call. But in Victoria, Emma was able to make some friends. She liked spending time with members of the homeless community and street performers around town. She also liked to hang out with boat owners and artists in the city's inner harbor. Emma would spend a lot of time at the library where she'd just sit and read in the children's section. Those who knew Emma and Victoria described her as free-spirited, kind, giving, private, creative, and highly sensitive to people. Emma preferred nature to city living, 
Naturally, she loved to travel and adventure, and she still preferred to walk around barefoot. So Emma was kind of an unconventional person. She's very talented in many different areas like cooking, photography, and art, but she didn't like to conform to mainstream society. So she didn't like cell phones, social media, spending money, or doing things the way that everybody else did. But Emma was also showing signs of serious mental health issues. In the winter of 2011, a childhood friend that she was staying with saw some pretty concerning behavior. Emma had developed this compulsive habit where she'd obsessively arrange objects like rocks, feathers, shells, and food into patterns. Sometimes she would insist that other people participated in these rituals. Also, one night, that friend woke up in the middle of the night and found Emma outside, and she was, quote, in a euphoric state, high on the grass and stars. The friend was really worried when she saw this, so she called James, Emma's father. So James ended up calling Emma and offered to fly her home, but Emma was super upset that this friend contacted her dad. She told him she didn't want to fly home and she would be fine on her own. James didn't tell Emma's mother, Shelly, about the incident. Shelly said that if she had known, she would have flown out to see Emma immediately. So three friends of Emma's say that she had been stressed out about something that happened back in 2008 or 2009 while she was at culinary school in Campbell River, British Columbia. She had felt like she was being harassed by someone that she had a bad experience with during that time. And according to one of her friends in general, she avoided social situations where she had to interact with men. That's why she decided not to stay at co-ed shelters. Emma didn't like when people asked her intrusive questions. Again, ever since she was little, she'd always been a very private person. She was friendly and trusting, but if she had personal struggles, she always kept those to herself. But she did love to write, and she used her journals as an outlet for her emotions. Still, when other people needed someone to talk to, Emma was always happy to listen. She loved to laugh, and you could see that she had a real joy for life. Socializing with friends was important to her. That's why in the summer of 2012, her friends started to become concerned about changes in Emma's personality. Things had been pretty normal at the beginning of the summer. Emma had a seasonal job working at Redfish Bluefish, which is a seafood restaurant in the Inner Harbor. It was around this time in June that Emma cut out a lot of habits in her life so she could live a more pure lifestyle. For example, she quit smoking cigarettes, binge drinking, she quit drinking coffee, she quit sugar, and some of her friends said that she occasionally smoked marijuana, but other friends said that they had never seen her taking any drugs at all. Emma had also purchased a red Mazda MPV van around this time, and her goal was to eventually live in the van and travel around Vancouver Island. She was hoping that this would give her more freedom, more independence. So when she bought the van, she took it straight to a storage facility where she was holding some of her stuff in a locker. The staff remembered that Emma was beaming with joy when she moved her belongings into the van. But unfortunately, this van would turn out to put a strain on Emma financially. So Emma was also on a strict vegan diet. However, she started off this summer by experimenting with different food combinations, including rice, popcorn, and pieces of fish. And we aren't sure exactly how long she was eating as a non-vegan, but this might have been because she was working at the fish restaurant. But as the weeks went on, Emma's diet and lifestyle became even more restrictive. By late summer, her friends noticed that she'd become sort of monk-like in her eating and social habits. She ate very little, and she started drinking a lot of water every day. The shelter staff said that she drank gallons and gallons of it, and it started to make her look very thin. I kind of wanted to touch on her whole diet changes and lifestyle. It seems like she's going through. One of the things that made me think of is the fact that if you're drinking gallons of water a day, although it's rare and kind of difficult to experience by accident, water intoxication can definitely happen. Yeah. And it's basically, if you guys aren't familiar, it's when basically what it sounds like you're drinking so much water that it causes a disruption in brain function. And most people who experience water intoxication are either athletes, military training, or people living with mental health conditions, most likely schizophrenia, uh, psychosis, personality disorders, or affective disorders like anxiety, depression, bipolar. Um, you know, mm -hmm. some of the symptoms, headache, vomiting, drowsiness, weakness, double vision, confusion. And then as far as her diet, um, you know, a lot of because I noticed that she was vegan and stuff and maybe she was just vegan because she, I would that wouldn't surprise me. She seemed like the type of person to naturally gravitate towards that sort of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. But also a lot of people with eating disorders practice some sort of restrictive diet, such as 
being vegan or vegetarian. And a lot of times they use this diet as kind of an excuse excuse as to why they aren't able to eat something or, you know, go to a specific restaurants or whatnot. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And one specific eating disorder, um, orthorexia, is actually when you're obsessively focused on eating pure, healthy foods. So again, did she have this? Maybe, but also she could have, you know, been practicing veganism for more of the traditional reasons Uh, but one thing that i found really interesting is the fact that emma liked to cook she went to culinary school she cooked for her dad um, but she rarely ate herself and if you guys don't know this it's very common for people with eating disorders to still be obsessed with food whether that's being Mm -hmm. around food Mm -hmm. watching cooking shows cooking for other people reading about food magazines that type of stuff Um, and so you know, she kind of fits a lot of these characteristics. Yeah, um, definitely. Again, you know, maybe thoughts. maybe it's not really, I mean, I'm thinking too far into it, but mm-hmm. it's odd how it kind of pieces together. And Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that you brought up water intoxication. I didn't really think about that, but that could actually make some sense here. If the shelter is saying that she drank gallons and gallons of it. I mean, that's a, a lot that is. of water. And Especially for a small person like her. Right. Also around this time, Emma was becoming more and more withdrawn. She hung out with her friends less and less, and they noticed that her behavior had become very fearful. She was described as being withdrawn and somewhat paranoid. She'd also been putting a lot of distance between herself and others. It seemed like Emma was anxious about the changing of the seasons as well. Her job at Redfish Bluefish was only for the busy summer season. She was set to return in February of 2013, but it doesn't look like she had another job set up. It looked like she wasn't sure what she was going to be doing once fall hit. But her friends noticed the biggest change in Emma during November of 2012. And this change was very dramatic. Whenever Emma's friends invited her to do something, she would refuse. She seemed too afraid to go anywhere other than the shelter or the pier. For example, at the last minute, Emma bailed on a trip to Mexico that she had been planning with a friend. It seemed like by mid-November... Emma was preparing for some sort of move. She was giving away, selling, and throwing out a lot of her personal belongings. And she told one friend that she was possibly going to head for Salt Spring Island or Tofino, British Columbia. This kind of made me think, of course, people give get rid of their belongings and kind of declutter when they're about to make a big move. But also people give away their belongings when they are possibly planning to take their life. Yeah. Um, Very common. And as we know, she's disappears so Mm -hmm. again is that a sign i mean maybe i don't know yeah maybe that's the thing with this case is there's a lot of maybes Mm -hmm. but emma's other friends said that she had given them a whole list of other plans possibly sailing on a boat to mexico heading to san juan with a man that she barely knew moving to california moving to costa rica traveling to japan with her father living off grid somewhere in the woods visiting an aunt in Lanceville, surprising her family by going back home to Perth, Ontario. So clearly there were a lot of different plans that she was throwing around to different people. And we're not sure if she was actually, you know, planning on doing any of those things or if she was just giving people a list of possibilities or didn't want anyone to actually know what she was planning to yeah, do. Yeah, like so trying she to throw them off her different trail. things out yeah. there. But at the same time, she did like to travel. Like at one point after mm-hmm. she turned 18, she moved to China to teach English. Right. So it's not entirely out of character for her to, and you know, this is already like the second move she's made or whatever. So, yeah, you know, bouncing around was somewhat common for her. So it's possible she was really weighing all these different options and changing her mind constantly. We don't really know. So the van that Emma bought had still been giving her trouble. She started asking around to see if anyone knew of a cheap mechanic. The van had also been towed three times, which obviously put a lot of financial stress on Emma. But probably the most concerning change in Emma was her behavioral changes. She started showing clear signs of serious mental illness around this time. Staff and residents at the women's shelter noticed that Emma had become very paranoid and depressed. Her curtains were drawn at all times. One day in early November, a friend drove by the shelter and saw Emma outside looking cold and wet. She was standing completely motionless and staring at some crows on the street. And then another incident at the shelter actually prompted the staff to call the police and request a mental health check. 
Emma had been frantically moving furniture out of the shelter onto the curb. When she was asked why she was doing this, she said the furniture was making too much noise and saying things to her. So obviously, this is a pretty clear indication that something was wrong. The staff believed Emma was suicidal or suffering from mental illness. But because of the privacy laws, the shelter couldn't contact anyone in her family. They had to call the police instead. But the police didn't perform a mental health check. Instead, they told the staff to keep monitoring Emma and call them back if her behavior got worse. They never made that second call. Today's episode is brought to you by Apostrophe. And let me tell you, I am such a huge fan of Apostrophe. They have transformed my skin this last year. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team so you can get customized acne treatment for your unique skin. And through Apostrophe, you can get access to oral and topical medications. I use both that use clinically proven ingredients to help clear acne. For a very long time, I was dealing with acne really all over my face, but for the most part, hormonal acne, which is like down on your chin and on the bottom of your cheeks. And it is so awful. Not only did it make me feel super self-conscious, but it was also just painful, especially at night. I'm a side sleeper and I hated the feeling of having all these little bumps. I had tried so many different products, but I am not a skincare expert. So it was really hard to figure out exactly what my skin needed. So that's why I love Apostrophe. They've made it so easy. And I love having access to an expert derm team right from my home. And I mean it, they have transformed my skin. My skin has never looked better. And I get, you know, occasionally a breakout here and there, but it's so minimal compared to what I was dealing with. And I just continue to see more and more improvement in my skin as I continue to use my Apostrophe treatment plan. And we have a special deal for our audience. You can get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash mile higher when you use our code mile higher. That's a savings of $15, folks. And this code is available only to our listeners. So to get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash mile higher and click get started. Then use our code mile higher at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you so much to Apostrophe for sponsoring this episode and improving my skin. Now, this takes us to the days leading up to Emma's disappearance. Around this time, one of Emma's friends tried encouraging her to spend less time at the shelter. She told Emma to get a membership at the local YMCA and hang out at the library as much as possible. She also strongly suggested that Emma call her mother. And on Tuesday, November 20th, Emma visited the YMCA to purchase a membership. Surveillance footage from this visit showed that Emma appeared very nervous and fidgety. During a 14-minute period, Emma entered and exited the building four times. She pauses for about a minute each time she enters and exits the building. So let's go ahead and take a look at this surveillance footage. There's no audio, but it is very, very strange activity and definitely worth taking a look at. So, so if you're listening, yeah. Yeah. There's no audio on this surveillance tape, but it's just... Basically, the camera's on the front doors of the YMCA, and you see Emma coming in and then going out like through the double doors over and over again. Mm -hmm. And looking as if she's waiting for someone or worried about someone being out there. She just looks concerned. Mm -hmm. And investigators who have looked at this are obviously also playing with the idea that maybe somebody was following her or something like yeah. that. But, but then again, I feel like if that were the case, I, th I think the the activity might have still been a little bit different. This is like mm -hmm. so repetitive that it just it doesn't it doesn't make any sense at all. Like cuz you could s still see out the windows for if you just sat like in between the two double doors. Yeah. versus like why go all the way out, all the way in, all the way out, all the way in. Well, maybe she's trying to look up and down the street. Yeah, but I'm just saying why go through the du double doors over and over again? Why not just go through the one set of doors if you're worried about somebody outside versus coming all the way through the double door, standing there looking outside then going um back to Outside the other pair of doors, you know well, what I mean? If she was waiting for someone, she could have been going out to see if they were coming, you know, down the street. Right. Well, but what I'm saying is the doors that, that are on the actual street itself, why not just stay on the inside of those doors? Why go through the other set of doors? You know, there's the little. Oh, yeah. Um, Sorry. I do know what you're saying. You know now. what I mean? The, yeah. I forget what that's like called. Breezeway. The breezeway. Yeah. I mean, it could have been cold in there. Who knows? Could have been. Any it, it is. Reason, it is very strange behavior, strange. though. It doesn't doesn't really make any sense at all. Mm hmm. So the next day, Emma called a tow truck driver and arranged to be picked up from the shelter. She was having her minivan towed from Souk, British Columbia, back to Burdett Avenue in Victoria. This was about a 50-minute drive one way. Souk was about 25.5 miles or 41 kilometers from the shelter. 
The driver said that Emma was very upbeat during the ride. She explained that she was going to surprise her family by moving back to Perth. She looked up at the snowy mountains and told the driver that she couldn't wait to see the sun and snow again. Two days later on the 23rd, Emma called her mom around midnight. This is where Shelly first gets some indication that something is wrong. On the call, Emma was in tears and she told her mother that she wanted to come home. Obviously, this call was very concerning for a number of reasons. Emma and her mother really didn't talk all that often, so her calling for help in the middle of the night was very unusual. Shelly told Emma that she would book a flight for Emma so that she could come home immediately. Emma anxiously asked her, are you booking the flight? She wouldn't tell her mom what was wrong, but she did say that she was safe. A few hours later, Emma called her mom back. She told her that she would stay and figure things out herself and Shelly shouldn't come. Her mom was still very worried and she knew something was terribly wrong, but she wanted to respect Emma's wishes, so she canceled the flight. Emma called back and changed her mind again just a few hours later. She told Shelly that she did want to come home, but she needed help packing her things. So again, Shelly immediately booked another flight. The next morning, Emma called back to change her mind once again, and she said that she was staying. Her voice sounded more calm and confident this time, but Shelly could still hear some sadness in her voice. She agreed not to come, but she didn't unpack her things. This reminds me of Bryce Les Pisa a little bit. Like the fact yeah, that a little bit. they were like having strange behavior, calling their parents, being like, okay, like parents offering to fly and meet them kind of back and forth. And then the kids are like, never mind, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that really like, erratic behavior. Yeah. We've seen this in a few disappearances with college age kids mm -hmm. or people in their 20s. What do you think the root of it is? Mental illness could clearly be playing a part here. Do you think there's anything other than mental illness that could be a factor here? Like that could be scaring them or making them so undecisive with oh, their decisions? Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing is we just don't know. There's a number of things that could have been going on that that's what makes it so hard, especially with Emma. Is she was just such a private person that there could have been a ton of things going on in her life that we don't know about. Um, but yeah, ma mental illness really could be a major factor here, especially if she was um, struggling with schizophrenia, I know that normally pops up in your 20s um, in a lot of different cases. So that could have been going on here if she was afraid of things that didn't actually exist. Um, I don't know. It's hard to say with the information that we have. I mean, based on where she was staying, too, I'm like, I wonder, I mean, the types of people that she probably interacted with probably weren't always, you know, the necessarily the most decent people out there or just you know mm -hmm. obviously you know on the streets you can run into yeah. a wide variety of different people good and bad so and that's is it possible that, that she maybe got herself into some trouble or yeah. you know mm -hmm. you know sadly just a fact a lot of people who struggle with being homeless are you know use drugs and substances like that's just a very prominent thing people who are living you know out on the streets and stuff are unfortunately exposed to a lot of horrific substances and could that have somehow sparked psychosis yeah schizophrenia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and it is really hard to say who emma was around or influenced by especially with many people in her life saying that she was so open to everyone and kind to everybody that she could mm -hmm. sometimes uh come in contact with the wrong people and kind of let them in her life and that was something as we said earlier that her dad was worried about but then only so much though she's like also super private right. so it's like how much information is she actually divulging to these people that she's inter interacting with yeah or That's is a good she point too oh man it, yeah it's really hard to even say but later that day parking enforcement left a notice on emma's van that it needed to be moved so she arranged to have the van towed once again, and this time to the Chateau Victoria Hotel parking lot. Shelly did not hear from her daughter the next day, which was November 26th. By the 27th, Shelly was very, very concerned, so she decided to call the number Emma had been calling from. The caller ID, though, said Sandy Merriman, so Shelly had assumed that this was a friend Emma had been staying with. The staff at the shelter, however, picked up the phone when Shelly called, and they informed her that Emma was actually a resident there and Emma had been living there on and off since the winter of 2011, which this news absolutely shocked Shelly. She had no idea that Emma had been living in a women's shelter. Later that day, the Chateau Victoria Hotel put a notice on Emma's van that it would be towed. Emma called her mother that night in tears. She asked for her help coming home, and Shelly told her she would come the next day. 
and she immediately booked a flight. The last thing Emma said to her mother was, I don't know how I can face you, which this now takes us to the date that Emma disappeared, November 28th, 2012. There is a lot that happened that day, so we're going to take you through the timeline of events as they happened. Don't know how I can face you. I know. Very so, weird. Is that because of actual events that happened in her life, or is this potentially just all things that have in her head type of thing? I mean, it really could be anything, right? We just don't know. My guess is it has something to do with the fact that she was living in a women's shelter, and mm -hmm. clearly Shelly didn't know that, and so perhaps Emma was trying to keep that from her parents. But why? I don't know. At 4.30 a.m., Emma called Shelly for the last time. She told her mom, don't come, mom, not today. Her family told Shelly to respect Emma's independence and not go to Victoria. So Shelly told Emma that she wasn't going to come. But Shelly knew something was very, very wrong, so she decided to fly out anyway. Emma went to Chateau Victoria at 7 a.m., and she noticed that there was a notice on her minivan. So she went inside to talk to the staff. She was very upset by the notice, and she asked for another day to move the van. So the staff agreed to give her one more day. At 8.23 a.m., security cameras captured Emma visiting a 7-Eleven at the corner of Douglas and Humboldt Streets in Victoria. While there, she purchased a $200 prepaid credit card. Very Emma, interesting. Yeah, the prepaid credit card. Mm -hmm. Which I'm like, what was she using before? Just cash? And why why'd she need a prepaid credit card other than maybe as we find out to use the phone perhaps? Yeah. You know, to set up her phone plan or something. Yeah, could have been that. Emma was wearing a beige winter jacket, camouflage pants, and her hair was tied up in a bun. She was also carrying several bags, including her orange purse. At 10 a.m., a Frenchman named Julien Ouad. That's my French people. <laughs> it was honestly pretty good. Can but you hear it again? But Julien Ouad <laughs> noticed Emma standing on Pandora Street near the Our Place Society building. Our Place is a homeless shelter and a soup kitchen, and Julien is actually someone who knew Emma from the summer of 2011, so he recognized her. But we're going to actually take a closer look at Julien Ouad later on. But for now, we'll just tell you what happened that morning. So Julian decided to get off the bus a few stops early and talk to Emma after spotting her. She was wearing a light-colored puffy coat and a hoodie with the hood pulled over her head. Her long hair flowed out of the hood and looked messy. She was also carrying several bags. Julian was able to see her back and side profile, but he couldn't see her face. So he left to go register for his health card, which was his original plan. And on his way back, he found Emma still in the exact same spot. Julian asked Emma if she needed help. She shook her head no, and he hung out there for a little while before he decided to leave. There are some reports that Emma visited the library around noon. Early in the afternoon, a friend saw Emma on Pandora Street outside of the Our Place soup kitchen. He asked if she was all right. Emma told him that she wasn't feeling well at all and she couldn't talk. The friend asked Emma if she needed a hug. Instead of responding, Emma gave him an uncharacteristic, horrified expression and walked away. So a witness saw Emma shuffling around on Pandora Street around 1 p.m. She had a blank stare on her face and her hair looked freshly washed. The witness later reported this sighting to the Victoria Police. There were several more sightings of Emma that afternoon. One witness saw Emma walking downtown with an older man, but they didn't give a description of this man. Another witness saw Emma at the Rock Bay shelter at some point. However, this is a co-ed shelter and we know that Emma would have refused to stay there. Two witnesses actually saw Emma on Douglas Street looking confused. She was walking back and forth, looking lost. Her behavior was so strange that this witness called 911. The police took the report, but we don't know if they actually followed up. Then from 4 to 6 p.m., Emma was spotted by the same person at two different locations. The witness first spotted her walking slowly down Douglas Street. Then 45 minutes later, the witness was in their car, stopped at Douglas and Finlayson Street, when they saw Emma crossing the road. She looked at the witness, gave them a sad smile, and the witness really wanted to help Emma, but they were worried that she wouldn't trust their intentions, so they didn't stop to help her. This person reported the sighting two days later. At 5.54 p.m., Emma went back to the same 7-Eleven and purchased a prepaid cell phone. This cell phone was never activated, and Emma did not have a cell phone before this. Surveillance shows that she looked nervous, and she waited by the door as if she was afraid to leave. Let's go ahead and look at some clips from 7-Eleven. 
So we slowed down this footage a little bit. So she walks into the 7-Eleven, goes up to the register, and um, buys this prepaid cell phone. She's, you know, casually talking to the uh, clerk, and then she goes over to the door, and she's just looking outside. Is Can't tell if she's looking for someone or waiting for someone, afraid of something, but she's kind of just lingering by the doorway and looking out the door. Around 6 p.m., Emma went back to the Sandy Merriman shelter. One of the staff members informed her that her mother was on the way, and this made Emma very upset and anxious, and she ended up storming out of the shelter. One resident tried following her out, but quickly lost sight of her. Shelly said that she had talked to the shelter the day before, but she never informed them that she was coming, so she doesn't know how they found out that she was flying in. So that's very weird. As the night went on, a light rain started to fall over Victoria. At 6.10, a driver with ABC Taxis picked up Emma near the shelter. She asked the driver to take her to the airport. However, Emma changed her mind quickly, and she told the driver she couldn't afford the $60 fare. This was odd, considering that Emma had $2,000 to $3,000 in her account at this time. She also had that $200 prepaid credit card. Regardless, she asked the driver to take her back to the exact spot that he picked her up at. When they got there... Emma asked if she could sit in the taxi for a bit. The driver noticed that she was acting strange. At one point, she heard the driver's dispatch radio make a noise, and this made her very anxious and paranoid. She asked, why is there noise coming out of that? So she then paid her fare and quickly got out of the taxi. And just by chance, an acquaintance named Dennis Quay spotted Emma only five minutes later. She was standing barefoot on the street corner, looking disoriented and paranoid like she couldn't cross the street. Dennis thought that the whole scene looked off, so he walked up to Emma and asked if someone was following her or if she was looking for someone. Emma didn't really say much. She just kept looking all around her, but she asked Dennis to walk with her for a little bit, and he agreed. Naturally, he wanted to figure out what was wrong. He tried asking Emma some questions, and clearly he was concerned, and that made her more and more uncomfortable. So then Emma decided to walk on her own. But Dennis still felt like he needed to do something. So around 7 p.m., he went into a restaurant and called the police. Dennis told the operator that there was a woman in severe distress walking outside the Fairmont Empress Hotel. So two police officers arrived at 7.17 p.m. and they found Emma barefoot clutching onto her shoes. Dennis debated whether or not he should stay and see what happened with the police. But when he saw them talking to Emma for a while, he kind of just assumed the officers would take care of her. So... He left. According to police notes, Emma did not have a conversation with the officers. She would only nod or shake her head and give one-word answers. She didn't even speak until 30 minutes later when they insisted that she give them her name. They asked her where she was going and they pointed out that she wasn't wearing shoes and Emma apparently refused to put her shoes on. So here's a Victoria police sergeant explaining the conversation that Emma had with the other two officers. Where, where are you going? You're not wearing shoes. Her response was, I'm, I'm uh, working through some things right now. I'm just going for a walk, and then I'm going to go to a friend's house. They asked her um, some fairly pointed questions about her, her well-being. Um, you know, are you feeling depressed or sad? Um, and she said, no, she wasn't. They asked her very specifically, are you feeling suicidal at all? Uh, mm-hmm. Are you feeling not healthy? And she said, no. And, and they also asked her about feeling homicidal. Are you feeling like you could do something to somebody else and she said no the police say that they couldn't really do anything beyond that so they let her go and a lot of people including emma's mother think that the police should have done more in this situation here's her mother shelly and one of emma's friends and a victoria police officer reflecting on the situation now the benefit of hindsight which we don't have at the time of responding to a call of course if we knew that emma was then to go missing for nine years never to be seen from of course we would have wanted to to remain by her side and make sure that she was safe but shelly Filipov says the officers should have used their common sense they just let her go off into the night well what happens to a person who's that vulnerable who's wandering around in the night truck drives by she hitchhikes or doesn't the truck pulls over and says it's midnight, there's this woman. Emma's longtime friend, Marie Flanagan, agrees. Emma is a beacon and has always drawn the, the most wonderful and the creepiest people to her. And that is something that makes me nervous because someone could very easily take advantage of that. Yeah, that's a reoccurring theme that we hear friends and family say, that she seemed to 
I mean, she was so friendly with people, but also so reserved. But she seemed to, yeah, really attract people who may not always have the best intentions. And this could have played into her disappearance or that's what it seems like some of her friends and family believe could have happened. Obviously, the police can't, you know, take her away just because she's acting a yeah. little bit strange. You know, she's not mm-hmm. posing a threat to herself or the community. So they kind of just have to let her you know, be, but my question still stands of like, should they have maybe called an ambulance, mm-hmm. brought in someone medical to do some sort of check on her? Or do you think that they did the right thing of just kind of, you know, trying to help, but then when she basically refused help, leaving her and letting her go? I mean, my, my thought is the cops aren't, you know, an average patrol officer interacting with somebody is not going to have the knowledge to be able to like discern that necessarily right unless it's like glaringly obvious and and this kind of goes back to the whole idea of of how police departments should have like a mental health officer right Mm -hmm. who is Mm -hmm. a trained whether it's like a trained psychologist or somebody who's just able to help people in crisis or at least come and talk to them and and Mm -hmm. potentially approach the situation in a different way that might yield more answers right right because i mean a uniformed patrol officer coming up to you i mean a lot of people's anxiety heightens right you automatically think i did something wrong Mm -hmm. and so people usually clam up or don't want to talk to police or just kind of tell them you know the answers they want to hear and so this is a prime example of why there should be some sort of Mm -hmm. mental health officer somebody who uh you know the police that are out patrolling the streets can bring in to potentially kind of counsel that individual to try to figure out if there is actually something else going on because just observing somebody with strange behavior is you know just kind of looking strange and and acting strange in public is not a crime it's not it's not necessarily a reason for you to need to call an ambulance for that person so i think i think honestly the police officers did did above and beyond probably what most cops would do especially in america like they'd probably just roll right on by and like not even stop to talk mm-hmm. to this woman so. or not even show up yeah or mm-hmm. not even show up or just you know be like oh it's just a homeless person moving on to my next next thing in my night so i understand shelly and and yeah. emma's friends you know why they're concerned and feel that something more should be done i just don't think they had the ability to do more like you can't mm-hmm. just take it upon yourself to be like this person's in crisis this person needs help this person needs right. uh, in medical services when there's no evidence to suggest that and so. of course in hindsight you wish that they would have done more but how were they supposed right. to know they what had was no about idea. to happen yeah, they had no idea where she that she was going to disappear and, and so they want to respect her as a citizen and right. give her her space she's which over she clearly 18. wanted yeah clearly um, she's allowed to walk around at night yeah. looking confused you're and upset, allowed to not like, wear your shoes doing anything. Yeah. yeah but yeah it's sad i just wish that when authorities are getting a call about someone who could be potentially in mental distress Mm -hmm. that they automatically are able to bring some sort of resource in like a psychologist or something Mm -hmm. um this is so needed yeah i mean how many cases have we covered where we see a situation where a mental health professional was clearly needed and could have made a huge difference well not just disappearances in many cases of police brutality the individual the victim of that brutality is often mentally ill and is not able to accurately respond to the mm-hmm. officer's uh, commands and things like that. And so a lot of people end up dead yep. yeah. because officers aren't adequately trained to deal with those with mental health issues. And so, well, that's like a whole nother profession. It's really not their fault that no, they don't have this They're just training. doing, doing what, there's, yeah. what they know, which mm-hmm. I mean, obviously in different cases, sometimes it's blatantly obvious. I just think with the current state of affairs, it's it's absolutely mind blowing that this doesn't exist yet. Like yeah. in the yeah. current state of the world and the number of of, I know. of, of mass shootings and every they other type of ever. type of, of tragedy that happens on a daily basis here in this country and around the world that this wouldn't be like a number one priority. Like, why don't we take a little bit of that money that we spend on the military and then put it into like a nation a nationwide right. mental health force that is all around the clock that dispatch that when you call 9-1, dispatch is able to dispatch uh, not only a police officer for security, because obviously you need to secure the scene and make sure that there's nothing violent's going to go down, but also a mental health officer that is trained and can, I mean, the mental health field just as a 
profession needs more, you know, careers and jobs, I feel like. And so why not add something like this? It's just, and I mean, you could probably say there's reasons for why there, this doesn't exist, but it just seems like, why not? Why not at least give it a try? And I, I think there have been some cities that have done s some programs similar to this where they've seen really positive results. So, because yeah, maybe would have gotten different answers from Emma and potentially have been able to, you know, get her the proper help or mm -hmm. at least somebody to talk to to find out more about her situation. Or even a female officer yeah. when dealing with, you know, a, a female. And, and oftentimes, especially because she did have a right. fear of men. Right. Well, again, the male officer responding is not going to necessarily know that, but. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get there, and that's the thing is usually a female officer is called in after the fact if that individual needs to be uh, searched or something like that. But in this case, this was just kind of like a a general welfare check in a way. So it's like, yeah, you know, and and a lot of times most police forces don't have the not ne don't necessarily even have a woman on that shift. So there's not even a woman to call in and you know to talk to somebody. So yeah, an another another possibility, just maybe more female officers. I don't know about you, but I know whenever I feel, you know, a little bit under the weather, oftentimes I find myself going to almighty Google to try to figure out what is wrong. When what I should have done is go to the experts, the professionals that specialize in the care that I actually need. So stop looking on your own and turn to ZocDoc. ZocDoc helps you find expert doctors and medical professionals that specialize in the care that you need and deliver the type of experience you want. ZocDoc takes all of the searching out of the equation and all you have to do is go to ZocDoc, type in your location, you know, what type of doctor you're looking for, and then you can find a doctor that has available appointments, sometimes even the same day, which is absolutely amazing. And best of all, you can find an appointment time that fits your schedule. So the next time you're feeling under the weather or you're just looking to get your annual checkup, head over to ZocDoc.com slash mile higher and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C.com slash mile higher. ZocDoc.com slash mile higher. So the two officers were the last people to see Emma. Around 8 p.m., Emma walked off into the night alone, and they believe she was heading towards the West Shore area. She hasn't been seen since. Meanwhile, Emma's mother had been anxiously making her way to Victoria to see her daughter. But when she arrived at the women's shelter at 11 p.m., the staff told her that Emma hadn't claimed her bed that night. Shelly arrived only three hours after she was last seen. So sadly, she just barely missed her. The shelter immediately called the police to report Emma missing. And the police arrived a little after midnight and declared Emma as a missing person. However, Shelly said the police didn't do anything for three or four days. Instead, they told her that Emma was just out partying. Of course, Shelly thought this was ridiculous as Emma wasn't a partier. And the shelter confirmed that she showed no signs of drug use. The next day, Emma's minivan was towed from Chateau Victoria Lot to Always Towing Lot. The police found the van there a few hours later with all of Emma's belongings inside, including her passport, laptop, and clothes. Then they towed the minivan to their lot. During each shift change, Shelly came back to the shelter. The staff informed her about Emma's recent concerning behavior, including the furniture incident and her paranoid state of mind. They believed Emma was depressed and possibly suicidal. That day, a witness reported seeing Emma at Lifestyle Market on Douglas Street in Victoria. However, this sighting is unconfirmed. A search team made up of friends, family, and volunteers looked for Emma all over Victoria and the rest of Vancouver Island. These searches included trails, parks, and smaller islands in the area, but sadly, Emma didn't turn up. On December 2nd, another witness reported having an odd encounter with Emma by the inner harbor after dark. Emma told the witness to remember the name Emma Filipoff and told them to repeat the name three times. Three days later, on December 5th, 2012, at 11.17 a.m., someone used Emma's prepaid credit card at a Petro-Canada station on Souk Road. Since Emma was a missing person, the card had been flagged and the police were able to track it down. They discovered that a man had used the card and the man was taken in for questioning and passed a polygraph, which I hope that's not the only way that they cleared this guy because as we know, polygraphs are extremely unreliable and to just give somebody a polygraph and they pass and be like, all right, go on your way. I don't know. I hope they did some more checking into him. I mean, he did have her card after all. 
but he had told the police that he had found the card on the side of the road near Juan de Fuca Recreation Center and Galloping Goose Trail in Colwood. This was about seven miles from where Emma was last seen, which would be about a two hour and 15 minute walk. The Galloping Goose Trail is actually a hiking biking trail that links Victoria down through Colwood up to Souk. At night and during the rain in November, it'd probably be cold and isolated in many spots, which would make it an opportune spot for would-be predators. That is definitely something to keep in mind. But later, the man called Shelley on three separate occasions with a different story. He said that at the time, he was drinking heavily on a daily basis. He actually couldn't remember where he'd found the card because he was too drunk. He was just guessing based on his usual travel routes. The man remembered that the card was sealed when he found it. He waited a week after he found the card to use it to buy a carton of cigarettes. The search teams have investigated any location where a sighting have been reported, so the search areas widen and include mainland British Columbia and other locations across Canada and the US. But as it turns out, many of these sightings turn out to be women who looked like Emma. The Victoria Police Department had divers search the inner harbor for Emma, but they didn't find her. For a year, a private investigator worked on the case, but he couldn't find Emma. Multiple psychics and mediums have been consulted on the case, but nothing really came of it. At one point, the police were able to find Emma's computer hard drive and examine its contents. On it, they found a lot of poems, as Emma loved to write poetry, as well as her journals. These journals contain a lot of writings about Emma's life and her state of mind. Sadly, Emma wrote a lot of entries about feeling really depressed, lost, and alone, and these entries led investigators to believe that it was possible Emma took her own life. It reads, to everyone from dead Emma. Hello. I figure someone will be on this computer at some point and read this. Okay, so I'm dead. Floating about on energy or not. Watching dying stars, reviving stars, and dreaming milky dreams. And shadow dancing on your timelines. Or whatever. Good luck every heart. I love you, M. God, that just gives me chills. Mm. It's very interesting. There's so many interesting elements to that, too. She's so poetic. It, I mean, it's beautiful sounding, but very eerie. It is. There were other poems that highlighted Emma's mental state. One of them mentioned going missing. It reads, there is a promise of flight, and I lay in fear. In fear somehow, somewhere, sometime. Fear crept in. She's missing. I'm missing. Emma's mother does not believe that her daughter took her own life. A panel of experts gathered by the CBC documentary series, The Fifth Estate, did not believe this was a suicide note because it didn't have the usual characteristics of one. According to them, there was no planning, no listed reasons for taking her life, instructions or statements about being depressed, hopeless, or not able to go on any longer. I think that's kind of strange to just come to that conclusion. I think you really can't rule that out. I mean, it did say, okay, so I'm dead. So mm. I don't think you can just say, oh, it's not a suicide. No, it definitely could have been. In her or own in her awareness I mean, that right. she w thought maybe she wouldn't be alive. Well, there's not like a some uniform, uniform way to write a suicide note. Right. Everybody's different. Everybody, you know, she's very, very deep individual. So yeah. why would, you know, she may not necessarily just write it out plainly. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And I'm not saying I think that she commits suicide um, or committed suicide. That's not actually what I personally believe. But I'm just I don't saying, think I you think can discount weird to, that. to rule it out. Yeah. 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 Still, the fact that she was writing about her own death is concerning when you consider that she's now missing. Maybe she foresaw that she was going to die soon. There's a chance that she believed she was going to be killed by someone that was following her. In fact, in one journal entry, Emma wrote, I feel like I'm being stalked. Now, let's circle back to Julian Uat. Before we mentioned that a man named Julian who knew Emma had seen her on the street that day, she disappeared. Well, it turns out this encounter is actually a hell of a coincidence, and Emma's family thinks it could be more than just that. Emma met Julian Uard in Perth during the summer of 2011. Like many others, Julian was captivated by Emma's beauty and personality, and he was instantly smitten. However, Emma didn't feel the same way about him. Emma moved out west, and that was supposedly the end of it, but it wasn't. Julian would repeatedly call the Philippoff's house in hopes of talking to her, and we don't know whether or not Emma was made aware of these calls, but oddly enough, that August 2011, Julian moved out to none other than Victoria, British Columbia. He said that he thought it would be a good place for cycling, paddling, and woodworking. And even weirder, one day Julian actually ran into Emma randomly near his work. 
He apparently had no idea that she had moved there. He claimed that they were both shocked to see each other, but Emma was quite happy to see him, according to Julian. Later, he actually emailed Emma's father to apologize for the phone calls. He mentioned that Emma had left quite the impression on him that summer, and he apologized for how he handled the situation and if the calls annoyed him in the process. But he also wrote, the last thing I want to do is be stalking her like I did the last time. Mm -hmm. He literally says stalking her. But Julian has said that he misspoke when he used the word stalking, as English is not his first language. Which I what can understand mean? to an extent, though. Like, he may have not understood, like, bothering yeah. her accidentally, you know. Maybe. Kind of, like, following her. Well, isn't that stalking? Yeah, but, like, he Pursuing her he, too much. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know. He just got the words mixed up. Right. Which I'm not, not saying, not trying to, like back the dude up but i can kind of understand like the language barrier he accidentally used that in the wrong context than what we would have taken it as but still he's acknowledging that whatever he was doing yeah. wasn't ideal totally and he apologizes for he it. he was pursuing her hard whether she liked it or not so mm -hmm. call it what you will but do you guys think that it was a coincidence no no i don't either and i think that maybe he was the person that she was constantly looking out for mm -hmm. and worried about i mean maybe maybe it's just an, maybe. just an idea which obviously the police were interested in talking to Julian. He voluntarily went in for questioning to clear his name and he was given a polygraph. And when he passed, the RCMP cleared him of any involvement in Emma's disappearance. Julian has said that seeing Emma and Victoria was just a coincidence. Again, clearing him with a polygraph test, mm -hmm. which is concerning to hear, which Very. again, we don't know how much more they did in addition to that. But if that's all he did, I would be yeah. concerned about that because people fool polygraphs all the time. Yep. So I don't know. I don't know if it's something different in Canada or not, but I don't know. That just concerns me yeah. quite a bit. Okay. So this is also very strange. In May of 2014, police got a tip from the owners of a clothing store in Gastown, Vancouver. They reported a suspicious interaction with an agitated, quote, creepy man inside the store. The man had walked inside with a crumpled up piece of paper and turns out it was actually one of Emma's missing persons posters advertising a $25,000 reward, which is very weird. I mean, why would you take down someone's missing poster and crumple it up? I mean, super odd. So the man asked the store owners if he could throw the poster out. He explained, it's one of those missing persons posters, except she's not missing. She's my girlfriend and she ran away because she hates her parents. Surveillance cameras in the store were able to capture footage of the man. This grainy footage shows that he was wearing a green shirt, had a noticeable limp, and had a flame tattoo on his arm. The police have not been able to identify this man. This whole interaction definitely makes you think, especially because he said, because she hates her parents. And we know that Emma didn't hate her parents, but it seemed like their relationship could have been rocky at times, and she clearly was avoiding them. So the fact that he had that little bit of information kind of makes me think twice about him. And it's frustrating that they've never been able to figure out who this guy is. And then there's this. In 2016, Emma's mother, Shelly, and her brother, Matthew, were arrested on a slew of drugs and weapons-related charges. Matthew's house was raided, and police found cocaine, MDMA powder, and fentanyl all in quantities deemed for the purpose of trafficking. He was also in possession of bear spray and a switchblade. Police also raided Shelly's home, and they found cocaine, marijuana, bundles of cash, a sawed-off shotgun, a double-barrel shotgun, ammunition, and a switchblade. Shelly said that her son had been using her house as a stash house without her knowledge. So the charges against her were dropped later that year. And Shelly has said that the charges have nothing to do with Emma's disappearance. Josh, do you think these could be related? I know you were saying that yesterday when we were talking about this. That yeah, maybe I don't know. I don't know what kind of... It's interesting. We don't have a whole lot of information on what her relationship with her brother was like. Yeah. But the fact that he is... I mean, he's trafficking very serious drugs. I'm concerned, especially about the fentanyl. That is there a possibility that Emma had ever gotten drugs from him or could he have been you know a higher level dealer and perhaps there was other dealers that were I don't know lower on the totem pole that I, I or even maybe was Emma involved in the drugs drug trafficking I feel like there would be more evidence for that and 
so maybe, many people maybe who knew not, her said though. that she, they didn't think she did any drugs. But she's a she very so obsessed with being pure. Private I don't person, know. though. You never know. I mean, yeah. Sometimes the most. Of course, it's possible. You know, sort of innocent private people are the ones that are, you know, doing a lot of these things. But again, that's mm-hmm. just a, that's just a theory of mine. I don't know anything, but it is interesting that he's involved in the drug trade on a pretty serious level. So yeah. So there was another major update in this case in 2018. A witness named William came forward and reported that he'd actually picked Emma up around 5 a.m. on November 29th, 2012, the day after Emma went missing. This man said that he was on his way to a new job that morning and he had already been running late, but he stopped when he saw a young woman in distress darting back and forth on the side of the road. William was concerned, so he pulled over. The woman got in the car around 1264 Escamalt Road in Victoria. She was barefoot, soaking wet, and seemed like she had been walking all night. When she got in the car, she went from distressed to calm and content. She asked William to take her to Callwood, where she was supposedly meeting a girlfriend. But again, William was running late, so he told the woman he could only take her a little closer to Callwood. Five minutes later, he dropped her off at the intersection of Craig Flower and Admirals, next to a Legion and a 24-hour gas station. The woman's behavior shifted back immediately after she left the car. She seemed paranoid and erratic, and she started darting back and forth in the street before she took off towards Callwood. And William didn't realize that he had picked up Emma Phillip off until much later. He reported this to the police in June of 2018. However, William found out that there was no follow-up to his tip. So he called up Shelly and reported the sighting directly to her. So Shelly and a team searched that area in 2018. However, sadly, nothing came up. There are still different theories and rumors about Emma still being alive somewhere in the British Columbia area. Some friends heard of rumor that she was alive and doing well, hitchhiking up and down Vancouver Island. Two people have claimed to see Emma panhandling on Commercial Drive in Vancouver. Many other people have reported seeing her in Vancouver's downtown east side or DTES. And some people have reported seeing Emma's missing posters in that area torn down. One source at a local establishment said that they saw Emma tearing down her own missing poster off the wall. Staff members at a hunting and fishing store reported that a woman who looked like Emma came into the store and asked how to disappear. She explained that she had a stalker who followed her from Ontario to Victoria, then Vancouver. At one point, an unidentified internet user said that Emma was, quote, a junkie living in DTES. This user bragged that he was standing next to her while she tore down her own missing persons poster. He provided no other details. There have been more reported sightings of Emma in the BC area. Many of these tips were followed up on and investigated, but nothing ever came from them. An age progression sketch of Emma was released in 2022, and this shows what Emma might look like today. The documentary about Emma's case is in the works, along with an accompanying podcast. Emma's mother, Shelley, still holds out hope that her daughter is still alive. She believes that Emma is not anywhere on Vancouver Island anymore. James, Emma's father, hopes that wherever she is, she's at peace. The two of them are actually on good terms now, and they have family dinners. Emma's sister wishes that she could be there so she could see how well they're getting along. Shelley really regrets not going to Victoria as soon as she had gotten that third phone call from Emma. She has struggled with multiple severe different mental illnesses since Emma disappeared, including PTSD, anorexia, and depression. She just wishes that she could see her daughter again. I cannot imagine being in her shoes. It's got to be just torture. So if you have any information on the disappearance of Emma Philiboff, please call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS or the Victoria Police at 250-995-7654. You can also send an anonymous email to philipoff at hotmail.com. For more information on Emma's case, please visit helpfindemmaphilipoff.com. So obviously there are several possibilities of what could have happened to Emma or, you know, she could just be out there and doesn't want to be found or she's out there and doesn't know who she is or is confused, doesn't know how to be found at this point. Um, There's so many possibilities. We also talked about suicide being a possibility here. Um, I don't really lean that way, but it's definitely possible. Yeah, other than 
her poems. I don't really see any other and potentially maybe giving away to her belongings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For evidence to suggest that she may have taken her own life. I'm very curious about this man with the green shirt that they're still trying to find out his identity. Yeah. Who was in that shop that said, you know, he tore down the missing person poster because it's his girlfriend and yeah. she doesn't want to be found because of her parents. Cause I think that's very interesting because there is a specific detail that he says in there that she doesn't want to be found because of her parents. Right. And the fact that he said that, I think, lends some credibility to what he said. Right. He could have just said she doesn't want to be found, but the fact mm -hmm. that he added that extra little detail, I'm like, hmm, mm -hmm. that's interesting. And I mean, is it possible that she is just out there, you know, maybe living kind of off off the grid so to speak and living with this man mm -hmm. um in the green shirt and they're just kind of living their life or she's or, living alone and he has nothing to do with it or he's holding her captive yeah of course that's um, a possibility he's holding well. her captive and against her will and he's that's just sort of his story and potentially he got the information from her that you know he's you know sort of started out as like a mm -hmm. um you know neutral relationship that eventually took advantage of her i mean that's a possibility i think there's a very strong possibility that she is just you know missing by her own choice that she doesn't want to be involved with society doesn't want to be involved with their family i think her behavior leading up to this yeah, there's a lot really of evidence to that. back that theory up i mm -hmm. think just based on the way that she's lived her life that she's kind of always been yeah. trying to get away from everybody and especially with so many witnesses reporting seeing her take down her own sign mm -hmm. and she didn't want her mother to see her in whatever condition that she was in she clearly you know was very torn about even seeing her mother again so i think there's a good possibility that she's out there and does not want to be found and this happens a lot yeah i know janelle you had a thought yeah it makes me wonder kind of going off that did she plan to leave because she bought that cell phone. Yeah. And I think that's so weird because she was known to not like cell phones, not be interested in social media. So why would she randomly go buy that cell phone? It makes me think that she knew she was disappearing soon. And did she need it because she was, you know, meeting someone specific? She needed to keep in touch with someone. Just the fact that she bought that right before mm -hmm. she went missing makes me think she knew she was going to go missing. Right. Yeah. Especially since we knew, we know now that pretty much all of her calls were coming from the women's shelter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was a very like calculated planned purchase there and the prepaid gift card. Right. Or the, yeah, I wonder, wonder, I'm curious about that though. Why did that get dropped? Yeah. That, that to me, that's a sketchy sort of situation there of why'd she buy that then? Did she just accidentally drop it as she was walking along and she didn't realize it? That's kind of what one, I'm thinking. One possibility. Or, yeah. Especially Did somebody with kind of take like it from her flustered and you know kind of disoriented she was described i mean yeah that definitely could have happened but i do go back to this idea that somebody has been stalking her mm -hmm. and you I, I don't think you can totally discount julian's statement there that he was stalking her i mean i get that the first like you know yeah. first language thing and it's not yeah. his first language but Maybe she just wanted can, to disappear from the world for a variety of reasons, including her parents know. and Julian. I mean, from the documentary interview with him, it seemed like his English was pretty good. So yeah. I, I don't know. It, to me, and he just, I don't know, I get a weird vibe about him. And yeah. the I mean, coincidence is, you know, all those yeah. investigators were like, yeah, that, that coincidence. Mm. But is he involved in her disappearance? I mean, right. in my opinion, doesn't seem like it. Um, I think he could have been one of the reasons she decided to disappear and maybe he was the person that was stalking her that she was but worried she about also, what she was looking at all the time she also mentions in her writing so that potentially somebody right. was following her so maybe stuff. he's one of the main reasons that she decided to leave it also makes me wonder if because she is so secretive and she was very adamant on not staying at shelters with men so it seemed mm -hmm. like perhaps again i could be totally wrong here this is just my speculation that maybe she had some type of negative traumatic experience with a man yeah never publicly cool. to told anyone about it because mm -hmm. she was secretive and also just that's 
a lot of people don't want to talk about that stuff mm-hmm. and, you know, therefore doesn't want to stay in the shelter with men. Yeah. Was that same encounter that she had previously? Did that have something to do with her disappearance? Back in 2008, 2009. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that totally could be it as well. And I definitely don't think you can discount the green shirt man. And it, we don't know if it's something nefarious. It could be someone that she actually does trust and love who has wants to protect her by taking down these flyers. I don't think that because if she knew him and she had a positive relationship with him, wouldn't he not go in and be like, I know her? Like, what is yeah. he like, dude, don't say that. That like, is kind of stupid. I yeah. think that's weird. To That's drawing more attention to right. the whole thing. It could, he yeah. could just be a complete troll too. Who's that's just, true. Who's just... An could asshole have that's just trying to like make a scene about but again something. him mentioning her parents and that she doesn't want to be found that really aligns with the rest of the story so i don't i don't know i, don't I just th- think that's weird though if that's true it and is. she's with him and she's like oh i don't want to be bothered because i don't want to be with my parents or whatever and then he goes out and like outs her on that well he could have by and not even realized what he was doing or that they would yeah. report it and that true you know you just really don't know and you wonder why they haven't found this guy. Is it possible that both of them have left Canada together? Yeah, my, and- my thing is like, I feel like this idea that she's just traveling up and down the coast. I'm like, if that were the case and she was just like freely going up and down. And even if she was like within these transient communities mm-hmm. and homeless people and stuff, like I feel like there would, you know, I know there's un- tons of unconfirmed sightings. I feel like at, we'd at least have one confirmed sighting. I mean, Maybe. I mean, the chances of that, I feel like. But it is annoying one. that she left her passport. Like if she was planning to bail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in her van. You kind of need that. Yeah, that, that I go back to that too. She left all of her personal belongings in her van. Mm-hmm. Why not at least take your personal belongings, leave the van or try to sell the van, yeah. get money from the van. And then the way that she's, she's not completely broke either. She's got money in her bank account. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I think at the very bottom layer there is extensive mental health issues here what is potentially causing all of these sort of different paths to develop because the way that she's interacting with the world is just far different from the way uh somebody without these mental illnesses would interact with it and so Mm -hmm. therefore we're getting you know it's kind of sending us all off into all these different ways when it could just be this is just how she is and she's just I mean, she's really good at kind of operating off the radar, so yeah. she could just be roaming around all over the place. I mean, who it's, knows where she is? She could be anywhere in the world at this point, Yeah, for all we know. It's really difficult, too, because obviously she, as an adult, has every right to go missing, to not want to be found. And sometimes, obviously, we're just trying to help this family, but sometimes when we cover cases like this, I'm like, Are we doing her a disservice by continuing to spread the information about her if that's what she wants at the end of the day is to not be found? Yeah, but there's ways to do that without causing alarm, right? Like she could at least a lot like notify the authorities and be like, hey, I'm okay. And Mm -hmm. you know how people sometimes do that too, where it's like the authorities know she's okay, but they don't necessarily send that information to her parents. Well, they and in this case they could. Yeah, maybe well, they know that. Right. And they just haven't come public. And, that, with and it. that's what I'm saying is like that could actually be the, the situation here. And her mom is obviously, as a mother, just wants to make sure her daughter's okay and nothing bad yeah. happened to her. Because I mean, I really don't think she took her own life. I, no, I don't either. Most of the times when people just go off and do that, like you end up finding the body at some mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's been 10 years and nothing yeah. has turned up. So. I feel based on all the evidence that she's still out there and I mean hopefully in a positive situation and not being held against her will or anything like that what's interesting to me is that her mom is so determined to find her and and spends all this time looking for her but her father doesn't seem to be as concerned he seems to have kind of accepted that Mm -hmm. And maybe he knows something that maybe the mother doesn't, or maybe he just knows his daughter and knows that this is something that she would do. And he just hopes that she's at peace, whatever she's doing. Right. And that to me was very interesting too, that he's just kind of like at peace with it in a way of like, I hope she's at peace with whatever decision that she made. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's very think, telling that he said. Yeah, that. I think it's very telling. Versus, he's not out there roaming the streets with his, you know. Yeah, yeah. With Shelly looking for her, that and it seems me. like they definitely do not rule out the idea that she has chosen to leave. Um, and in so many disappearances, we hear families say, "There's no way, right? My child or my loved one would just disappear and do this to me, and just right. you know, leave us all with these questions." But they seem to think that that's something that she really could have done yeah well and as we've we've learned i mean when we research these cases and look at these cases we only have so much information right we don't yeah. we aren't in this family we don't know the family history yeah, on absolutely. the on the level that they obviously know it so it's in a lot of cases like this you go back to the family history and if you really get an inside look at things things start to make a lot more sense and obviously we know quite a bit from um, what we covered at the beginning of this episode. So there's a lot of dysfunction, a lot of things that happened that drove her away from her family. And mm-hmm. so to me, it seems like there's this isn't one of those missing persons cases where she was like really involved with the family, was there all the time, mm-hmm. and would never that, leave yeah. her family. And it's quite the opposite in this case versus where people go missing and they were like, she was going to be here tonight for, for dinner. And then she just disappeared. Right. And, you know, all signs point to foul play in, in many in many of those cases versus this case. I don't know that there is any evidence of foul play here and she left on her own accord. Yeah. And she's out there doing whatever she wants to do. Well, we definitely want to hear all of your opinions on this and what theory makes most sense to you. Um, and of course, like we said, if you do know anything, make sure to get that info to the right people. But that is going to be it for us today, you guys. Thanks for joining us again. Um, we'll be back next week. But until then, keep on taking your mind and